Namya Harenge Kyo. Today we start a new book. It's called The Basics of Buddhism by Pat Allwright. And just to explain, I don't like to read the whole book at once. It takes hours, okay? I prefer to do it in bite-sized pieces. And this book, you're going to find that they've got very short bite-sized pieces. But I think it's more beneficial because it will sink in. So, let's get on with it. So, the first page we're going to read is the preface. But there's a message before you can get there. And it says, If you wish to free yourself from the suffering of birth and death, you have endured through eternity and attained supreme enlightenment in this lifetime. You must awaken to the mystic truth which has always been within your life. And that is a quote by Nichiren Daisoshin. Okay, so we're going to read today the foreword, the introduction and a short history of Buddhism. Okay, so... The purpose of all Buddhist teachings is to enable human beings to overcome suffering and achieve happiness. A Buddha is an enlightened person, someone who is enlightened to the reality of life, who is in harmony with the rhythm of the universe, and who deeply understands the ent entity of the entirety of life. Although the enlightened state is very special, it is in no way superhuman. Buddhist teachings exist to lead people to f find enlightenment for themselves. Basics of Buddhism discusses concepts which are common to all schools of Buddhism. However, the interpretation of these differ markedly between schools. The interpretation here is from the point of Nichiren Daisoshin's Buddhism. The book explains the fundamental philosophy based on one of Nichiren Daisoshin's first letters about his teachings called On Obtaining Buddhahood. It, it also outlines the core of the practice. It concludes by explaining the role and purpose of Sokogachi International, SGI, the worldwide movement dedicated to peace, culture and education based on Nichiren Daisoshin's Buddhism. Basics of Buddhism have been written on so written so that each chapter is self-sufficient. It can be read in an order or dipped into at random. Buddhism has many specialized words which have been kept to a minimum for ease of reading. Where they are unavoidable, an explanation can be found in a short glossary of terms at the end. I am indebted to Barbara Carhill and Sue. Craxton for the time and energy they have adopted to helping me in writing and editing this book. I am also grateful to Paul Williams for the production, Eddie Comfort Dumas and Paul Miller for proofreading, and Jean Kemble for researching the sections of further reading. Thanks most of all to Daisiko Aikida, whose prolific writings and speeches provide so much material on the content and spirit of this great philosophy of life. And that's signed by Pat Owlwhite, the writer of this book. So the introduction. Over the centuries, our lifestyle have changed radically and this is continuing as an increasing pace. Advances in technology means that we have far less contact with the natural world than our ancestors. Our involvement nowadays becomes mostly in the man-made society. Communications travel at the speed of light and in this sense our planet has shrunk, shrunk to the size of a global village. Less than 100 years ago hardly anyone owned a car and aeroplanes did not exist. Nowadays we can travel 12,000 miles to the other side of the world in less than a day. Advances in technology were designed to make life easier and therefore happier. Sadly, people are no happier than they were before. As the natural environment recedes at an alarming rate, so people's lives seem to match in its desertification. Unable to encompass the huge bombardment of information, people feel powerless and alienated. The age-old question of why are we here and what is our purpose remains unanswered for most. Now, more over than ever, we need to develop our inner human qualities to lead meaning, meaning, to lend meaning to our lives. The famous Greek adage exhorts us, know thyself. Surely this does not mean getting to know our limitations, what makes us angry, what makes us jealous, or how long we need to sleep, which is, which is what most people mean when they say, I think I know myself pretty well. 
it must be referring to the enlightened qualities of humanity which exist in each one of us. Such qualities as, as reason, wisdom, love of others, trust, courage and tolerance. This being the case, Shukamundi, the first historically recorded Buddha in India, would have agreed wholeheartedly with this adage. He attained enlightenment through introspection, realizing that the universal truth of all existence. This is the way of Buddhism, to seek our own enlightenment and find our own answers to the meaning of life. In contrast to Western religions, there is no concept of God in Buddhism. The word religion is generally understood as belief in a higher power. If this is so, Buddhism cannot be described as a religion at all. It is better described as a philosophy of life. Buddhist concepts do not contradict common sense. In fact, Shakyamuni is reputed to have said, if it accords with reason, do it, and if, and if it works, do it. Whether or not he actually said this, Buddhist teachings are essentially pragmatic. They accord with reason, observing life as it is, and propose a logical approach to life based on the true nature of existence. In this country, people may have the impression that Buddhists observe many rules of behaviour or practice only in monasteries. monasteries. However, Nichiren Buddhism, Nichiren Daishoshin declared that Buddhism is life. It is not necessary to seclude oneself, give up eating meat, wear robes or shave our heads. These were all practices adopted in a much earlier time in different countries. They were largely matters of practicality. In fact, in Nichiren Daishoshin's Buddhism, there are no rules of behaviour. Society has developed to the point where codes of behaviour are built into the system of justice. Buddhism is founded on the utmost respect for life. Given this, we decide for ourselves what is the best course of action, based on our own innate wisdom, which arises and develops through practice. Deep down, what really matters is that we feel connected, connected to ourselves, connected to others and connected to the universe. With reference to this, Daisiko Aikida quotes psychi psych psychiatrist Dr. Jill Elks and John Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, USA. Healing is a restoration to the whole. The words healing, whole and holy all derive from the same root. Holy is being complete, being connected as a person and with another person, being connected with the planet. Pain is a signal that the part is separate from the whole. This throws new light on the, whole, the word holy, the desire for wholeness exists in all of us. Buddhism observes that suffering results from seeing ourselves as individuals entitled in development, independent of the universe as a whole. We think we are somehow separate, absolute and capable of living a self-orientated kind of life. The Buddhist doctrine of dependent or origination clarifies that all life is interdependent and that regarding oneself as separate is an illusion. Following on from this, frustration is the inevitable result of trying to cling on to things to try to make them stay the same. Life is changing constantly. What, when our lives are in harmony with universal life, we can feel free to enjoy this change. Buddhism is about becoming skilled in life. Change, troubled times and difficulty are inevitable. When we develop our inner strength, we can enjoy these times as well as the moments of tranquility. Enlightenment is not so much a goal as a process. Buddhahood is not so much a matter of arriving at a destination or reaching a goal as internalizing the process of continually strengthening the world of Buddhahood in our lives. This is termed entering this unsurpassed way. Attaining Buddhahood is not a matter of becoming a Buddha but of revealing what really exists within us. Buddhahood is not a superhuman state but the process of developing our humanity. The following chapters discuss some of the basic principles of Buddhism. Whether or not a person decides to practice Buddhism, the teachings provide a rational and humanistic philosophy to live by. People who hear about it for the first time often remark, I always thought that anyway. This is because ultimately we all know the universal truth but have become separated from them. 
The adventure into the inner self is an endless journey of discovery, insight and joy. A transformation in the inner reality of one's life in one's mind produces changes in the word workings of one's life in other peoples and other also in the land. A change in our determination first produces a change in the inner reaches of our lives. It enables us to manifest qualities of excellent health, abundant strength and boundless wisdom. A life that has been transformed in this way will lead others in the direction of happiness and be committed to overcoming suffering. It will also have an impact on society and the natural environment, transforming both into paradise of peace and prosperity. So, here's the first chapter. It says, the spread of Buddhism during the 2000 years after Shakyamuni. So, a short history of Buddhism. Shakyamuni, first historically recorded Buddha, lived around 3000 years ago in India. He was born a prince but renounced his secular life and devoted himself to finding a solution to the suffering of birth, old age, sickness and death. He attained enlightenment through meditation and then taught for over 40 years according to the circumstances and understanding of the people he met. His teachings are therefore many and, var many and varied and sometimes paradoxical. In the last eight years of his life, he gave his most profound teachings, the Lotus Sutra, despite the fact that he knew many people would not immediately understand it. When he taught this sutra, he urged his disciples to honestly discard expedient means. By this, he meant those them to discard his previous teachings, which had been proprietary. This did not happen partly because many of his followers did not understand and partly because many had already departed and were spreading his earlier teachings. This is why so many different forms of Buddhism exist today. Moreover, the teachings were added to or modified according to the culture and the understanding of the people. This is only natural, since Buddhism is not a religion of dogma but of action. It is a practical philosophy which relates to the time and place. After Shukamundi's death, Mayohara Buddhism gradually spread to China and from there to Korea and Japan. This took place over a period of roughly 1,500 years. During those periods where Buddhism flourished, peace, peaceful and prosperous societies were established. In India during the reign of Ashwa the Great, China during the Tisang the Tang Dynasty and in Japan during the Heian period. During the, ninth, the next 500 years, established Buddhism started to decline. It had become formalized and ritualized so that only monks or those were independent means could undertake the lifetime of austerities involved. It had lost its effectiveness for ordinary people and it was now time for a revitalization of the Buddhist teachings. Shakyamuni had foretold this gradual decline and predicted the appearance of a Buddha who would reveal the correct teachings for the time being 2,000 years after his death, which is known in Buddhism as the latter day of the law. He also predicted the many pre persecutions that per persons would experience, this person would experience. Nicholson Dysotian underwent exactly these persecutions and this is one of the many specific reasons for calling him the Buddha of the latter day of the law. Nicholson Dysotian, Dysotian means great sage, was born in Japan in 122-22. He was the son of a fisherman and was educated as a local te temple a common practice in those days. He chose to enter the priesthood and studied Buddhism widely before declaring on the 28th of April 1253 that Namyoho Renge-kyo is the correct teaching for this time period. Nichiren Daisoshin spent the rest of his life expounding his teachings, teachings which enable ordinary people living ordinary lives to attain the same enlightenment state as he did. On the 12th of October 1279, he inscribed his enlightened life condition on a great mandala called the Daigohonzon, dedicated to the happiness of all humankind. Nutrition Daisoshin declared that the Lotus Sutra is supreme among Buddhist teachings. 
This is mainly because of two points. It teaches that everyone without exception has Buddhahood and it reveals that life is eternal. The Lotus Sutra describes the magnificence and wonder of life. However, it is unlikely where we were we to read it that we would be able to understand it. The Sutra was expanded, expanded as great length using metaphors and fables. From his enlightened life condition, Nicholson Dysosian was able to read between the lines and declare the ultimate teaching. Although Shakyamuni described the wondrous state of enlightenment, he did not define the fundamental law of universe. Nicholson Dysosian revealed that the law as Namyo Horenge Kyo and taught a specific practice by which all people can obtain enlightenment. Everything has its essential point and the heart of the Lotus Sutra is the and it is its title, Namyo Horenge Kyo, a law that is easy to embrace and this easy to practice was taught for the sake of all mankind in this evil age of the latter day of the law. Wow, that was deep people. So I'm going to leave it there. So next time it will all be about on obtaining Buddhahood. So until next time, take care. <laughs>